Um, good okay. evening. Good evening. Got very little. We got people coming in, so we'll. We're going to give them maybe another minute because I want to be mindful of everybody's time. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. And uh, we're going to start at 503 just to let everybody get a chance to get in. I see a lot of people joining us. Yay. Yeah, we're going to get started. We had a good turnout at the first district community relations meeting the other day as well. Oh, good. That was that's one. That's what we want to hear. Okay, it's 503 and we're going to start our meeting now and I just want to welcome everybody to the CPOP meeting. We have a full agenda tonight, but what um, Commissioner Leon and I decided to do in light of all the um, different events that are going around the country, we wanted to take a vote and kind of push um, our agenda to next month because we were going to go over the final part of the CPOP policy plan. And we thought it was more important to give uh, a voice tonight. Um, we're going to be very strategic in, in how we have these, this conversation that um, the Commissioner, Commissioner Leon is going to have tonight with us um, to bring some of her expertise and just to kind of, just, you know, just, just, to, just to talk tonight. Please, one thing I want you to do is be mindful of each other and to put your phones on mute or your computers on mute so we can be courteous of each other. There are no room questions. Uh, no one is going to be judged. This is going to be an open floor. If we have um, some of our commanders on the phone tonight or joining us, this is not a time to question them about new events because um, the, the cases are still new and they don't, they're not going to share with you. That we're not going to be expecting them to do that. As long as you know, if you have questions that are going to be pertaining to overall safety, things like that, that's something that we'll sit down and talk about. But we're going to be very mindful of the commanders tonight and um, not put that kind of pressure on them because the investigation is still new on the events that took place in Cleveland. So without further ado, uh, Commissioner Leon is going to get us started tonight and uh, I hand it over to you, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, welcome everyone to this month's um, CPOP meeting. As uh, Commissioner Hadley said, we're going to go off agenda tonight and push the final overview of the CPOP plan to our May meeting in light of the events that have gone on around the country in Virginia and um, uh, Wisconsin um, and then our own um, to shootings, um, officer of all shootings that we've had here in Cleveland in the last 24 hours. So um, as this is about uh, the community and this is really a space for your voice to be elevated, we wanted to give you a space if anyone wanted to talk tonight or talk through uh, some of how you're feeling, how this uh, relates to the work that we're doing here in Cleveland as it relates to the consent decree and um, and the engagement or the relationship between police and the community. Uh, you do have the raise your hand feature that we would ask everyone to use if you'd like to speak so that we are being mindful um, of everyone's uh, ability to, to talk and not, not talk over one another. We ask that um, we, it looks like a small group, but as it gets bigger, um, we will, ask you to keep your comments to three minutes at a time. It doesn't mean you can only um, participate once, absolutely not, but uh, so that everyone have a chance to speak. So I will stop there and ask um, if anyone would like to start the conversation this evening. Well, Commissioner Leon and Commissioner Hatley. Hi, everyone. I'm Shalina Williams. Um, I am the community engagement uh, coordinator for the Cleveland Police Commission. Um, we were having a conversation, and I've been having conversation um, all this weekend and this week uh, with uh, community members who are concerned and upset as we all are. 
um, what keeps coming up, especially with the um, the case um, Dante, Dante, I believe his name is Dante, um, with his case is again how how does a 26 year you know veteran on the police force mistake uh, the Dante Wright? Thank you. Um, mistake the taser. Um, the gun for the taser, and that's this is not the first time that it's happened. Um, it is indeed a concern because officers carry both weapons uh, at all times. My concern is moving forward again. How can we ensure that this mistake doesn't continue to happen? So um, Samantha also had her hand up. I would I would say when we talk about um, ensuring that a mistake doesn't happen and it not being the first time, it would be very important to look at um, how many of these events have taken place. Uh, when you think when you look at the number of engagements that police have on a daily basis. How often in that does it happen and and what have been the outcomes of them? Um, we know that mistakes will happen. I think what the community is most um, upset about and what you have, have, have uh, mentioned is the. Um, how often it happens, right? So we would have to we can first start with um, looking at what the policy is and whether that officer was in or out of policy. So. Uh, and then we look at the situation, but uh, definitely that is something to take into consideration. I would be very interested in, to, in knowing how many other incidents of this have occurred uh, across the United States. So, Sam? Um, I hope that you all can hear me. Um, okay, good, because it's, you know, when you have Video on it sometimes lags, but okay. Um, I'm Samantha Montanez. For those of you who do not know, I am one of the young persons on the Leaders of Tomorrow work group with the Cleveland Police Commission. So I am familiar with some of you all. Um, I wanted to address Shelly's like question a little bit. Um, I this is very hard because there's no one there's no one answer because everyone has a different idea. Um, and I think right now my mindset might be a little different than most potentially in this meeting, just because I am a young person and what I'm studying and you know how I'm viewing things. But if we wanted to look at things from a systemic level and standpoint to answer Shelly's question, um, I don't want to say abolishment because it's such a polarizing term you know whenever you say we need to abolish something everyone goes on the defense and goes to their different sides such a polarizing ideology but think about you know i've i've been seeing this example going around especially with what's been occurring within these weeks and you know i've heard it before um but essentially like you know when you're you know they say there's a few bad apples in the barrel right or there's a few bad apples on the tree well you pick those apples out and then this tree is still sick, right? You know, oh my goodness, what is going on? Like I took the bad apples, I clipped everything, but it's still like not, it's still not healthy. So then you go underneath and you look at the root of the issue and then you're like, oh, the tree's rotten inside. Maybe I need to just take out the whole tree and plant a new one. And that same philosophy can be placed and, and can be used when we look at the police force and just policing in general. Um, I know not a lot of people are a fan of abolishment, but I think nowadays it is something we need to consider if we really want to continue to make our society better because the practices that were put in place 200 years ago have not modernized and have not, um, they have not changed with the times. You know, like I recently just read a book and basically it's called The Law is a White Dog and basically it's like the law just changed face 
and change meaning. So everything that's occurring that occurred back in slavery and stuff, like when everything was, you know, put in place, yeah, we're not seeing, you know, slavery anymore, but look at our prisons. That's modern day slavery. Look at, you know, they used to have chain gangs. They used chains in slavery. Look at just the way cruel and unusual punishment. Okay, that's our that's our right in the Constitution. Yeah, isn't it cruel and unusual that when you get out and you're labeled a felon, you can't even get a job and live somewhere? And then you're like arrested because you're trying to live off the street, but it's like, I couldn't get a house anyways. So all these things that were put in place 200 years ago, they don't make sense now. So it's like, we can't just rebrand it and refix it. It has to be from a radical place. And I don't even think of it as radical. It's just the right thing to do. So that's just something I wanna leave you all with. And, you know, I'll leave that there. Thank you. Thank you. So I will take a um, poll on how you guys want to do this. If you want to leave a space after each comment to discuss that comment, or do you want to move to the next um, hand that's raised? How many by hands raised? Oh, that's not going to work. I already have some hands raised. So thank you for that. Um, Sam, I guess you can also ask when you um, uh, share in the meeting if you would like to have discussion about it. Okay, so let's try that too. All right, Ms. Stanford. Um, first of all, your comments were very insightful, especially for someone younger. Um, takes a lot of people a longer time to figure that out. But um, I'm going to, you know, one of the things when we, when we talked about the um, the taser incident. I think one of the things I'm hearing is not so much that a mistake happened, but a, that a mistake happened with someone with 26 years of training who was a field training officer. And if that would happen, and my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that the taser is on your non dominant side and the service revolver is on your dominant side. So she would have had to have crossed over. And that's a problem, you know? And there's, it, it's really, it's very strange because. One of the problems that we see with what I do in the community is people understand that bad apples get in. People understand that people go through the screening. But the problem is, is when people try to get rid of them and get the bad apples out, you can't do that. And, and we run into fight after fight after fight after fight trying to get them uh, out of the police force. And the police force is not for everyone. And, you know, for, and it's I've seen some very, I saw a very good policing just yesterday in front of my house when they arrested somebody they were absolutely by the book they were professional in the whole nine yards but i like rather than abolish the police i like the term reinvent because as someone who monitors the scanner um the police get ridiculous calls like that someone's four, four year old child is misbehaving you know that's not a call that the police should handle you know th they're getting better with the cit unit is excellent they're getting better um with the training and everything but the cit needs and using the cit units but we need more cit training so i don't i'm i don't want to throw the baby out with the bath water but definitely we need major surgery on this thank you so much miss miller hi everyone uh, my name is Shanoa miller i'm a community engagement coordinator under doj granite digital c um what my main question is, especially with the Dante Wright situation, um, it seems to like we want to ask these questions pertaining to how many times has this specific mistake occurred? But really, do you really want to put it under the category of mistake or improper training, right? So we sit here and talk about, hey, there has been like a really good movement when it comes to CIT training and providing more trainings and things like that. But if the mentality of a police officer in a high pressure situation cannot compose themselves to handle a situation accordingly, then that training goes out that window because that's a mentality at that point. So do you really put it under the category of, oh, it was a mistake, I had no idea, but you already went through these trainings. So did the training fail you? Was it your mentality? Or did you just, you know, not feed or did you feed into, you know, the stereotypes of engaging with a black youth, right? So even if they have cultural competency training 
in a urban environment, does that really change the mentality of certain police officers um, when they're engaging in high pressure situations? Because if you cannot compose yourself um, and you're in a deadly situation, death will occur. And that's the issue that we're facing at this moment. So that was my piece. Thank you. Uh, James? I saw I was trying to turn my camera on, but I'm having issues right now. Um, I had a follow-up to Samantha's comment and then just a, a quick reference to something I saw recently. Um, when, when she mentioned the abolishment, uh, it's definitely an interesting thought and something I wanted to uh, give a, uh, maybe not a com comparative look, but a complimentary review is the English common law. A lot of our legal system is, is, is backed on. Uh, something i've been investigating recently you know should that that needs to be reviewed and possibly changed as well she talked about the uh the the amendments to the constitution you know a lot of our stuff is backed in that english common law which makes sense um at the time the united states was founded but now um, we should maybe review that there's different legal systems and different legal principles and practices that i i've known and i've seen um that U.S. courts, um, I, I quote unquote, say they pretend to follow, but they just find other cases to say they're not following it. So I, I was looking at that as well in companion, companion with looking at abolishment uh, or reorganization of police force um, of the judicial system as well. That would be, um, I think that's also important to review. And one other something interesting, I saw a report recently from the January 6th uh insurrec insurrections that they were the police officers there were, were allegedly told to specifically have restraint during those uh in, during that invasion so that just completely in my perspective completely destroys trust with com communities of color when you know that it seems like that order has never been given um so it's that was very frustrating for me to, to hear that thanks Thank you so much. Ms. Standerford. I'm, I'm sorry, that was an error. I didn't put my hand back. I'm sorry. I didn't... No worries. Uh, Ms. Miller. Sorry, I forgot to lower my hand. Would anyone? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see. Um, uh, Shelly. Um, I'm still muted and my son is mute. Sorry about that. And so um my my comment or question was um in reference to what Samantha was saying about the bad apples. Um I put it in the chat, you know, we do have bad apples and across the nation, you know, each police department is stating that, you know, there are a few bad apples spoiling the whole bunch. Well, my question is, you know, where are the good apples? Where are the officers who are standing with your brother? Shouldn't they be saying that's that's not right? You know, you need to stand down. There's a better way to handle this. Where are the good apples if we only have a few bad apples? Because they are ruining, they are ruining the name of policing. They need to stand up. What happens when they do? Are they ostracized? Do they lose their jobs? What happens to an officer when he or she decides to stand up against what they see is going on wrong? Because clearly with a George uh, Floyd case, there was not just the man, the officer with uh, his knee on the neck. There were several other officers standing there and they said nothing. They did nothing. Where are the good officers or the good apples? Thank you, Shelly. Samantha. Yes. Um, so I, I also want to just go off a little bit of what Shelly is saying too. Like I think her question is a great question. You know, where where are those good apples, right? Like, think about it when you have like, again, I like analogies because I just think it makes things a little more digestible for people because sometimes, you know, things just aren't as easily understood. But, 
you know, you have a classroom full of kids. The teacher, you know, takes out the students who are, you know, being bad, which that's a whole different thing. But, and, you know, they talk to them and they correct the behavior. And then it's like when that child and they're playing with their friends at recess and a child, if you if you've taught children well and you've taught them, you know, stick up for other people, you know, this is what you do in a situation. More, more likely than not, the child is going to stick up for a friend who may be getting bullied, right? Like, they're going to say, like, that's wrong. If a child who is in the fifth grade, fourth grade, third grade, second grade, kindergarten, if a child who hasn't even reached their developmental peak yet can understand, you know, sticking up for someone because so someone's doing something bad to them, if a child can understand that, I fully believe an adult whose prefrontal cortex is almost developed or is fully developed should be able to do the same thing. Um, so, and and another thing to Shelly's point is that you ask where do they go? They do lose their jobs. They do get ostracized. They do essentially get, you know, like um, they get put on, you know, like that, that list, like, oh, don't go to this guy because he stands up for what's right. Well, yeah, that's why he, I thought that's why he signed up to be an officer. Like, I thought that's why you all did. Um, so there's definitely that stigmatization and isolation within police culture that happens within, you know, the police communities. Um, and one does not have to be a rocket scientist or be a part of that to see that that does occur. Because we know and we see it in the news often, that this officer um, or this person, like I just saw one the other day, where it was a black woman who was on the force and she retired and they wouldn't give her her pension because she stood up and was like, why are you choking this kid? Like back in like 2000 something and they're finally ordering for her to get her pension. So yes, that does occur. And so that's when I go back to my whole point of you can't, you have to take the whole thing out in order to make it better because if clearly those good apples aren't doing anything, they're also not good apples. They're not sticking up for the people they said they would protect and serve. Um, and I'm not trying to cause like divisive conversation. I'm just trying to show like a different point of view, like just really look at this picture holistically and see how like, yeah, we can do this, but look at what happens though when we've tried and, and it still isn't working. So it's like, what is there left to do? Because there are too many black people, black youth dying at the hands officers and there's too much profiling occurring in our black and brown communities especially here in cleveland um so yeah i'm gonna hop off my rant but thank you so much miss standiford please call me ruth miss standiford is is like my mother um, I, I was go the point i was going to bring up was i have a really good friend from like 20 years ago DeLacy Davis, uh, Chairman, you may know who he is. He was a founder of a group called Black Cops Against Police Brutality. Now they have also formed with several other retired law enforcement. I think it's called the National Coalition of Law Enforcement Officers for Justice, and they do address a lot of issues. Um, it, shoot me your email, and I'll send. You, I'll give you the exact title of the group. But it's um, one of the people from. Um, she's a Lieutenant Cheryl Dorsey from LAPD retired from LAPD, and they do address things. There's groups called Black Cops Against Police Brutality. The woman that you were talking about was fired from her job 15 years ago in Buffalo because her white, a white officer was doing a chokehold and she stopped him. And one of the things, when DeLacy's written a couple of books and he just got his doctorate. But one of the things he talked about is one of the things you face is all of a sudden you don't have backup when you need it. You know, there's that thin blue line. And one of the things with the George Floyd case that I liked was the number of officers, including his own chief, who testified against him. Because if you remember um, in the Brelo case here with the 137 shots, there were like 119 policemen there and everybody would nobody would testify at the grand jury. Is, is that correct? Am I correct on that? Charmin, am I correct on that? None of the rest of them wanted to testify. They didn't want to cross the thin blue line. And so, it, you know, we they lost the case, but there's a lot of groups like that. And I've, I've heard DeLacy speak, well, I've talked to him many times, and he is an excellent resource. He does training. He does all kinds of things like that. 
but they do have a, a whole group as, as a whole organization. You can look it up called Black Cops Against Police Brutality. And it's an excellent website. And uh, he does a lot of training and stuff like that, that, like that with officers. So look it up. But, you know, it is a lot that people face. Sometimes that's the only job they've got. You know, and it's a good job with good benefits and they cross the line. And, and I mean, I'm with what I do on the street, I've had police policemen in some controversial cases tell me, yes, the officer was wrong, but I don't want to say anything. You know, and the thing with the George, the George Floyd is the officers that did nothing were as guilty as he is because they did nothing to stop it. And you're not going to tell me somebody's in fear for their life if they got their hands in their pockets. You know, but we need to get, we need to also, you know, even the people who filmed the George Floyd thing were threatened and everything else like that. So, I mean, it's, it's a lot to consider and it's, I don't, it's not a one quick fix, you know, not even close, but we got to start supporting the officers that do come out and do have enough guts to say, no, you're wrong, you know. Because there, a lot of them are, you know, like I said, I saw the arrest right in front of my eyes and they were wonderful with it. I've seen them with, with CIT cases and they've been wonderful, you know, but unfortunately not enough officers are trained and you've got some who should not be on the police force. And I've worked 27 years in a level one trauma unit in New Orleans and you know what the New Orleans police department's like. They had the, work, the lowest paid police department in the country and it showed. Okay. So, you know, we, we it's just, it's like I said, it's not a one-click fix. It's everybody on board. It's all kinds of different things. So we just have to be attuned to that. And that's my rant for the day. Thank you so much, James. I, I think Esther had her hand raised before me, so I'll give us I appreciate her. that. Thank you, gentlemen. Mm -hmm. I think James did have his hand raised before me. I put my hand after him. Chivalry is not dead. You go ahead, Esther. Yep. Okay. Um, I think like going to this point, definitely right. I think um the issue with the is like the issues with the entire police system. I think like um I did research on it like last year with my police side class, is that they have like I know it's women there, but like the reference to it is like the boys' club where like they feel like they need to protect each other like they cannot speak against each other even if they do something wrong which is like the mindset like you know that's how they are trained in a way they're trained to kind of like you have to protect the person inside of you because you have to make sure that person goes home but i feel like one thing is like you say protect and serve but it's protect and serve everybody not just like your fellow officers it's like the people you're protecting and definitely there are some good apples in the police system but at the end of the day um, one of the saying is that if a good apple touches a bad apple, then the apple is also um, affected. So we just can keep saying there are good cops out there, but there are still bad apples. They're just going to keep affecting those other apples. And we're going to see what happened in like George Floyd's case. Like, you know, there are so many cases. I feel like the summer times, that's when we see a lot of like young black male, like, you know, getting shots, like, you know, back to back. Like I was just on my social media page today and I saw someone who was like, um, a young black man who was getting arrest, um, harassed by a military man who was just walking in his own neighborhood. And, you know, the police, like, I mean, I'm, I mean, we are seeing some changes where they're like, people are getting charged, but like, are they getting the right sentences? If that was someone who was not in uniform, would they get affected the same way? So I feel like the force needs to start charging police officers as if they were also civilian doing the same thing, because at the end of the day, people are not gonna be able to trust the police if they know that like you know the police is getting protected by their own so i feel like we need to change the entire system like the way the pol police are trained and they need to stop like you know that brotherhood we have to protect each other because at the end of the day you you, um, you kind of like sign up to protect and serve the people thank you so much esther thank you james of course uh, I just had a follow up to Samantha's uh, analogy with the school and something that I, I've I've seen through I mean, not, not uh, research that I've, I've done for a long period of time, but for the the person you would expect that could react in a way that you think a uh, adjusted person or police officer would may be negatively impacted by what I've seen as are called adverse childhood experiences. And those are just things that are predisposed you to traumatic behavior and 
um, inability to cope uh, as what we would see as correctly in those um, stressful situations. Um, so maybe something like, for example, Derek Chauvin had some sort of adverse childhood experience, obviously not excusing it, but it wasn't caught uh, during police uh, recruitment and training, um, and it didn't allow him to react as we, he should have. Um, so it's really unfortunate that even a cycle that oppresses people uh, repeats itself and strengthens that cycle. Um, so just wanted to add that comment. Thank you so much. Um, okay, Mr. Dems, that you, someone must have mentioned your comment. I don't see your hand anymore. Frank Dems? Yeah, sorry. I, I, yeah, I took my hand down. I was, I was actually um, going to mention that um, in, in some of the training and, and conferences I've been to, I've seen um, a lot of uh, opportunities that police are presented with uh, in de-escalation training, where in that de-escalation training, if, if one officer on a team sees another officer uh, getting ready to lose his good government job, they have a mechanism to talk to each other and uh, remove that officer from the scene and keep them from making mistakes. But you need buy-in from the whole department. Uh, New Orleans PD did that with a program called EPIC about uh, 10 years ago after um, Hurricane Katrina, and it was uh, it was fairly successful. Um, and I know some of the commissioners are aware of some new uh, programs like that that might benefit uh, Cleveland uh, to, uh, and, and, and I'm sure that there's probably already some de-escalation training and some of that is covered uh, in the CIT training. But I did want to mention that there are programs out there, there are opportunities out there to to train officers, to get them to, um, you know, come into the 21st century. Thank you so much. Um, let me make sure I go in order. Okay, Ms. Miller had her hand back up and I see Shelly. Um, so we were talking about, you know, the good apple and one person out the group, especially dealing with um, a high pressure situation, speaking out and things like that. And someone talked about ACEs um, and how that contributes to um, trauma and also especially being a police officer. I think one of the things I want to touch on was what happens, right, where you have these group of police officers and we talk about bad apples. What if one of the bad apples is the superior and they choose not to do anything because they have to, uh, the discretion, right? And that right there is when you can't even turn to your own superior or, you know, your white shirt what do you do then? Do you go above that? What if that one is a bad apple? Do you go above that? What if that one is a bad apple, right? And so I think that's what I know some good police officers think about, especially. Um, but also, I know that this is a major conversation when people say, hey, everyone is human, right? People will make mistakes, completely understand. Um, and even though with the extensive amount of training that an individual has, something will eventually happen. It's just the fact that this is happening way more often and that is the issue. So even if you explore that person's trauma, that person's background or you know any um, traumatic instances that they have been put in as a young adult or a young person that could affect them in adulthood, you have to take that into an account when you are um, interviewing them and scanning them for the job because it is the job that they are signing up for. It is the job that they are trying to, you know, get and also sustain while they're there. So when people say, hey, this affects them, completely understand. You will go through trauma while on the job, without a doubt. But that's where those resources come in and also your good judgment comes in, which is very much needed as a superior if you're not a bad apple. Thank you so much. Shelly. Thank you. And so 
I just wanted to um, just kind of put this out there, you know, as a community, whether you're, you know, black, brown, white, I am sure across the nation, we have all become mentally exhausted with seeing this play out time and time and time again. And I'm going back to Trayvon Martin, and I'm sure we can even go back to Emmett Till and, and beyond, beyond that. We can go back 400 years. Um, we as a community, we've been traumatized since, since being in the womb up until now. Where can we, where can we go for self care? Where can you know? Where are the spaces that we can go to to get some relief from this? We see it over and over and over again in the news, and we're talking about it in in our public spaces and in our private spaces, and it's just it's just ever present. Where can, if anyone knows, where can you go to decompress so that you can continue, you know, within this this movement? Because it is indeed a movement, not just a moment. We have to be able to recharge so that we can continue to push on. Thank you for that. Um, we have a question in the chat or a statement in the chat for discussion. Um, everyone, please remember uh, feedback on what uh, Shelly uh, just raised. From Larry Heller, an unrelated question, new topic. So why don't why don't we see if anyone wants to um, give a response to uh, Shelley's um, question or ask about where people go to decompress? For those of us experiencing trauma, and and for this, I will because it's very important. Now, this is one of the reasons why. We pushed our um, regular agenda to next month because we knew people needed a space and um, to talk about these things that are going on. And sometimes um, this may be the platform where they can do that. So you can unmute yourself if you would like and um, kind of respond to that um, question of, regarding where people go for assistance and decompressing and trauma. Hi, hello. Hello. Hi, I'm on the phone. So I'm um my name is Ashley Evans and it's a little bit different interacting here on the phone. Um I do want to offer um a couple ideas at least. Um I'm very adamant in trying to find spaces to decompress and to heal within our own neighborhoods. Um, I live in the Buckeye Shaker Lit neighborhood in Cleveland, and um, I personally take solace in uh, the people that I've connected with here. Um, so it, it's been pretty hard, I would have to say, since COVID. Um, there's not um, as many activities to actually gather, um, but I just challenge us to be creative and trying to find uh, the good and the places and the people that we have closest to us. Um, and then directly as well, there is a woman by the name of Lana Gamble. And I um, am trying to think of Willow Cove is the name of her business. It is on Larchmere. And Lana offers some creative spaces through art and art therapy to uh, try to uh, process a lot of different emotions, but including anger and anxieties that we feel. So I would, um, you know, she's not necessarily on a call, but I, I know she would be welcome to anyone who needed the space. She offers a lot of different programs. Um, and I'm sure too, she'll have even more programming as we can get outside. She did some art therapy last summer outside and things like that. So if you, um, you can find her online on Instagram or Facebook. The name of the business again is Willow Cove. And um, 
I, I, there are great resources there. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. And I see Shelly writing feverently. So I know we will have that as we continue to improve with these um, uh, meetings. Everyone, we, we plan to have a response on our um, website from the meetings. We have the, the uh, YouTube, we have the recordings, but we also want to give responses to things like that. Like that is very, you know, uh, important topics that folks raise that where we can provide resources or reference material um, after these meetings. So please keep keep a lookout for that on our page. Um, did anyone else want to speak to where we go for trauma or for um, decompressing or uh, anything before we move on to um, Larry's topic? Yeah, I was going to say something. I think um, that's a very good point to bring up, but like most communities, like especially like in the black community, we don't believe in mental health. Like that's something at a young age, as much as I wanna be like, let's decompress, let's do this. But like some people think like, you know, going out there, you know, fighting against the justice system, that's their mental health. And I think um, the first thing to do before even saying bring this program is educating like these communities. Hey. Black community, um, about How are you? of mental health and why we need it. Good. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. Um, okay. Please mute your phones to give respect to the speaker, please. Thank you so much. Um, why we need this mental health issues? Because like I know in my community, like, you know, I, but even in my family, they don't believe in mental health, like going to a counselor, speaking to a counselor. But I feel like we're being these traumas every single day and we need to educate like, you know, communities of colors, the importance of mental health, why you need it and like why these programs should be funded. And most communities that mental health is needed, the mental health programs are very underfunded. So that's why we see most people who say like defund the police, they're saying defund the police and put mental health like, you know, in programs in place that can support these communities because it's very needed. Thank you so much. This is, you know, you guys, every topic you built, you brought up has to do with reform, transformation, reimagining. It's, it's always that the community really does have the answers. You really have to listen, right? And so, um, um, yeah, I just wanted to, to elevate that. Larry? Hi, this is Larry. Um, yeah, regarding the trauma, uh, once upon a time, several years ago, there was a lot of talk and several proposals about creating several crisis centers around town, you know, both east and west side. And that kind of has disappeared because the pressure's off now. Uh, but at one point, we were very, I thought we were very close to some agreement on that. Uh, back during the uh, big deal about all the tax money going to remodel the queue, there were a number of groups in the community they got a bunch of petition signatures and we're asking for uh, dollar for dollar matching investment in neighborhoods, which would have included uh, not only rec centers and housing and things like that, but would have also specifically included crisis centers. And uh, I think, you know, that has kind of disappeared from our from the picture. And I think it's important we keep up because sooner or later there are going to be more future huge downtown development projects with our two Clevelands, you know, putting all the money into uh, downtown, often privately owned for profit uh, ventures, uh, taking all our tax dollars for that with no investment in the neighborhoods. And I think it's important we remember and keep up that pressure that if we're spending public dollars, we want an equal investment in our neighborhoods where it's needed, including not only housing and rec centers, but also mental health services. And also that topic does kind of tie in to what I had typed in the chat, but I was typing already before she spoke about mental health trauma. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. And actually, you also speak directly about the co-responder, which is a, um, uh, 
model that a lot of departments are taking on. Um, again, and when you speak about the crisis centers, when um, Esther spoke about the uh, reduction in funding for those supportive services and, and over the years how police have been cut, become the catch all for the social ills that we have. You know, um, I listened to a a forum the other day and a gentleman said the first person that talked to me about defund the police was the police because they're saying it's not fair. This is too much. Everything is being left on us because you're defunding everything else. And then when we go into situations and handle them in a way that we're not equipped to, and then we're, you know, so that's part of it. But we don't want to separate the history of policing in the United States from that either. <laughs> it was the issue way before that, right? So, um, but that's part of it as well. And so we see how it just snowballs and becomes bigger and bigger where these things are happening on, on a regular basis. Um, I think, so don't, oh, Shelly, you have your hand up. I just forgotten to take it down. Can you raise your hand, please? It is right in the reactions tab at the top. You'd almost miss it because either you are putting thumbs up or clapping or whatever, but at the raise your hand is right at the top if you're on a desktop. If you're on a phone, I don't know. Sorry, I don't see it, but this is Larry again. Hey, Larry. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, as you were saying, you know, the, I think the mission of the police has gradually expanded and expanded and expanded. Uh, my understanding, their purpose is public safety. And yeah, that's still the, a purpose and very important. Uh, but we have gradually just given them by default too much other stuff that may be better handled by others, such as should uh, mental health um, uh, situations be handled by mental health professionals. You know, there's uh, the most frequent example is the hoots being done in Oregon, uh, but they're all over the country now. They have different programs uh, here in Cleveland. We do have a co-responder model. They did they did a pilot project several years ago. It was very successful, reducing emergency room visits, reducing costs, reducing jail for frequent repeat uh, recyclers. Um, so the co-responder unit was very uh, effective. And that was on a pilot project with a temporary grant a few years ago. Now they just started a permanent co-responder unit, but it's it's still small. Uh, I would like to see that expanded. And many cities are also going to an alternate responder because there are some situations that just don't need a police presence. And in fact, nationally, they're uh, starting the 988 model as an alternative to the 911 call with uh, dual dispatchers or a dispatcher trained to, di to differentiate between what requires a law enforcement trained officer and what doesn't. You know, just like I think there used to be, I don't know if there still is, used to be separate people just to issue parking tickets that aren't, that they don't do all the same training as regular police. You know, uh, that'd be a great example. But I think people trained in mental health are much more effective responding to a mental health crisis. You know, going back to like Tanisha Anderson, um, you know, could have made a big, maybe could have made a big difference. Thank you. Thank you. Sam. Um, yeah, I wanted to actually tie Larry and Shelly's point together a little bit. Um, where can we go and then how do we offer different services right and so i grew up in the rec centers as a kid my dad grew up in the rec centers my dad worked for the rec centers um, i played all the sports and i did all the things through the city of cleveland recreation centers um, and i know that a lot of the kids i grew up with they like i know my privilege and my place and, and what my parents were able to afford me and those rec centers and having role models such as my dad or other rec instructors gave other kids who are my age or a little older or younger, gave them the stability they might not have had at home or at school. So in reference to where can we go, we need to fund our recreation centers better. Those are supposed to be the place where our community members, our friends and our family, where we can go. And not only can we go swimming and have fun and congregate, 
but it should also be a place where we can go decompress in and just go relax, um, especially for our black community here in Cleveland. Um, as you know, all the rec centers are situated distinctly in certain neighborhoods to serve certain populations and are in different um, areas that typically fall on the lower socioeconomic like ladder, like lower in that ladder. So that's one place I think we need to revamp and refund because that should be the center of where our kids go, where our, our adults go, where just everyone in our community should be able to go there um, and, and decompress. I think that's one thing. And then as for the mental health aspect and, and this broadening of police, um, this like the police, you know, what their job description is essentially, it's because we've criminalized everything as a society. We've criminalized mental health. We've criminalized homelessness. We've criminalized, you know, being young. We've criminalized being poor. So everything that goes on in this world that you get arrested for, that you get detained for, it's been criminalized. Like, that is why the police have to handle that because our legislatures, our politicians, our city leaders, our federal government, you know, this a lot of it has happened since the dawn of time, but especially, you know, with that pickup in the 70s and the 80s, there was that fear um, that politicians use and it's still used today, like tough on crime. And who did they show that was, you know, committing crime? Black and brown people. And so it's like, OK, we got to be tough on black people and tough on brown people. So now we we've, we've criminalized your skin color more and they're in poor communities. We're going to criminalize poor people. And we're going to criminalize people with mental health issues. So until we figure out that thing, of course the police are going to have to handle that because you've made it made it a criminal act to be deviated from what society thinks is acceptable, especially if you're black or brown, and especially if you live in the inner city or in a city and you're poor. Because it's okay for white people who live in the suburbs to have a mental health issue. They can go to counseling and go to rehab. But for us in here, we have to go to jail. Because if I feel a certain type of way, and I want, you know, not saying that I do, but for the example, if I wanted to go take my life, I can get arrested and put in jail. But the white girl in the suburb potentially could, she gets the help she needs. So it's all about who's criminalized for what and what is being criminalized. And that's why officers have to handle these calls because everything, even existing, is illegal nowadays. So that's just something else to think. Well, that's a lot. <laughs> but it's right on point. It's right on point. Again, like I said, the community always has the answers. And you go right there, right? And what our solution? We know what you highlighted even more the problems, especially when you say criminalizing everything, all our social ills, and how that then is the skin color, right? And we knew that behind the way that we um, uh, handled the crack epidemic and how we handled the opioid epidemic. That's another trauma for black uh, and brown and marginalized communities because where those folks were criminalized for their addictions and dismantled communities, you know, we are actually being asked or to, directed to bring people back to life. Not and oftentimes it's not just once a day, it's two and three times a day. That's a trauma for the black community. And when you mention those rec centers, I just want to um, highlight um, that the rec centers got additional funding for training of their staff regarding trauma and, and were rebranded as neighborhood resource and rec centers right at the end of 2019. And of course, we know we had 2020 happen with the pandemic and all, but, you know, um, time that it takes for things to change oftentimes gets a bad rap. That's what um, uh, the boss my, um co-founder of the Center for Policing Equity just uh, mentioned the other day. It does take time, but as the community voices continue to be elevated and say, we know what the issues are, here's what we believe are the um, part of the remedies. And since you guys work for us, that's where we say that these resources are gonna go and that's what we want it to look like. So thank you for that. Ruth. I want to add a couple of things because working in a trauma unit, you see everything. And one of the things that us, one of the things that there's a need for is community education about what exactly the police can and can't do. 
I've seen, you know, we monitor the scanner as part of um, what I do. And there is, that there'll be a custody issue and they'll, the police will get 15 calls to go check on this child. And that, it, that every time it's nothing, you know, or they'll be calling on the, 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 the baby's mother, be calling on the baby's father, you know, or the kids will be calling domestic violence. Um, I had one client that every time he would beat her up and, and she would call the police and then he'd call children's services. You know, there's a lot of times you hear people that will say, you know, like I said, my three-year-old's misbehaving. So, you know, automatically you're putting the police in as a, with his child, you're putting the police in as a bad guy. And as a nurse, they used to do this with us. They'd bring a child in with an asthma attack. If you don't behave, they're going to give you a shot. Well, of course I'm going to give her a shot. She's having an asthma attack, you know. You know, what is that creating in the child's mind? Because we're dealing with kids, a lot of the group I work with, we're not dealing with kids who have an adverse childhood experience. We're dealing with kids who are 24 seven adverse childhood experiences. I've told this before, we were doing group one day and I asked, we had 94 people in the group and I asked how many of them knew somebody who'd been killed? 100% of are a victim of violence, 100% of the hands went up. Some of, about more than half of them were related to somebody. You know, our kid, we had two kids that there was a police chase, not clean when it was OSP going down Kinsman one day. And two, we look up and two of our kids are headed to the store down at Tanini's. And we yelled at them to get back and they got upset. And one of them came to me and said, could we talk about this? And I said, yes. And I said, did you see the police cars going down the street? He said, yes. He said, but they were in the street. I said, do you know that during police chases, they will turn around, run up on the sidewalk and they really don't care who's standing there? They said, no, you know, and so you have to be able to have places they can talk. I'm sorry about my phone, but it's the other side of creation. I can't get to it right now. Stop. There you go. And I apologize for that. But uh, we did a thing a couple of times called painting with the police and the, and the safety forces. And we had the police from community relations and some of them from the fourth come in and they paired with the kids to do painting projects because it was a less threatening environment in the middle of a crime scene. And it, you know, we really broke down some of the scenes and talked to, we do things sometimes, there's a high profile scene. We'll talk to the kids about what happened, about, you know, not making stupid moves, like if your hands are up, turn around and grab and go for your belt, you know, things like that. But with the officers too, and I saw this in the emergency room, they would automatically assume, I mean, we had one doctor come in who was black and they assumed he was trouble. And we're like, no, he's in charge. He's not, you know, he's not, he's not a criminal. He's in charge of the emergency room, you know, and they, it's just, it's got, it's got to be education. Like I said, it's not a one click fix. You know, the, the kids need a, a safe place to talk. And as we talked to our kids one day and they said, talk to us, talk with us, don't talk at us. And so often that's what people are doing now is they are talking at you. You know, we have somebody come in at summer camp every year. Kyle Walton, before he retired from the ATF, came in and did a wonderful thing with our kids, explaining things. And he talked a lot. He said, I'm a black male. He said, if I go out of town, and he talked about how he behaved. And he said, I am a federal agent and how I behave. The kids were like, you know, he gave a scenario about, you know, one of the kids, you driving in the car and somebody does something stupid and gets pulled over. The officer's walking up to you, sees a gun on the floor. Who's going to go to jail? And they're like, oh, the driver. And they're like, no, y'all all going. Do we figure out whose gun it is? You know, so they were able to dialogue and that's what we need more of. The kids were able to dialogue and they were not, not only able to dialogue with an officer, but one who looked like them. And that's crucially important because you can't steer the ship if you don't get it in the boat, you know, and it is hard. I mean, you know, I've seen very, very good police officers and I've seen very bad ones. When I was in New Orleans, we had an awful shooting where they gunned down a 90 pound woman in a bathtub after an officer was killed. And, and the, the, when she was a threat to my life, I said, you're 180 pounds, she's 90 pounds soaking wet in the bathtub, come on, you know? But and we ended up putting them in jail actually, but a lot of research and a lot of work, we got federal charges on them, but that's another story. But anyway, like I said, it's not a one quick fix and everybody's got some very valid points, you know? So hopefully we can put them into, play, into practice. And that's my rant. <laughs> Thank you. It's all contributions and input, not rants, because there always is gold nugget in everything. 
Okay, so um, that was in the screw. Where are we? Are we at Shelly or? Yeah, definitely go. I want to kind of piggyback on what Ms. Ruth was saying um, about how, how, especially in communities of color, we are training our um, our children, and in, in, in particular, our black male youth, uh, how to interact or engage with the police. I, I personally, personally hate that we have to train our children away in a way to engage with police officers. I do understand that it is to preserve their lives, but it should never be so. Um, and even I think there was a there there's a, another case out where um, a military officer uh, uh, was engaging with officers and you know exercised that training, put his hands out the window to let them know that you know hey I. I don't have anything. I'm not a threat. I'm even afraid of you. And they were still yelling, you know, obscenities at him. And so even when we, you know, again, exercise this training, we are still at fault. Um, the young man, Dante Wright, you know, uh, there was another, another woman um, in Texas who I believe she, you know, she, she was doing nothing and the officer wanted to put her in handcuffs. And she refused, she, she told him, you know, I've done nothing, don't put me in handcuffs, and began to run away. And, you know, as a result, her life was ended. And so um, back to, to a point that I was trying to make earlier, um, a friend and I, we were talking and he said that Dante Miller made his mistake in running. Well, we all know that we're guilty whether we run or not. And most often we'll take our chances with running. And so um, I just think that um, there, there, there definitely has to be, you know, some conversation or training around, um, again, on the officer's part, how to engage with us, you know, how to engage with especially our youth, because we are afraid. We are afraid and we we exhibit that behavior through, you know, trying to preserve our lives and, and running away or or even in being compliant and and still losing our lives. Something has to something has to change. Something has to change. That's my comment, my rant. <laughs> Thank you so much. A couple of things I want to um, highlight. Um, when you spoke about um, we're guilty whether we run or not, you know, that's what I've heard when I was doing the um, going around the community with recruitment. It's, you know, why do you run? Um, <laughs> you know, because, you know, you can be you can you'll you'll catch a charge whether you're you're guilty or not. Right. Um, so you don't have to be guilty of a crime to be convicted of one is what they said. And so, like you just said, I'll take my chances running. Because as we see, the most people who are exonerated um, of being wrongfully convicted are people of color. So there's that. Um, when you said for the police to learn how to engage with the community, um, a few years ago, they started the reverse ride along community engagement day for that very reason for recruits to take them into the community and be educated by folks in the community about the history of uh, the relationship of the community and the police here in Cleveland, and also to see that uh, most of our citizens, our law abiding citizens don't come out here with a mindset that you're on a hunt or you're, you know, because um, again, that affects the way that you engage with the community. And finally, when we talk about de-escalation, I just want you guys to, uh, I want us to direct you to a training by Don McCray called non-escalation. And we saw that oftentimes it's not the citizen, but it's often the officer that escalates the issue. So de-escalation doesn't work if you're the one escalating it. So it's about not not necessarily de-escalation, but how to teach um, uh, officers how not to escalate to begin with and make the situation work. Okay, Ms. Moore. Thank you so much. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, 
just as a, an officer of the court and, and judicial candidate, I wanted to talk about a couple observations that um, I've observed and a lot of it stems or kind of piggybacks on what Ms. Sam said and Ms. Ruth and uh, Ms. Shalina. Um, years ago, at least in the city of Cleveland, there was a requirement that you had to live in the city in order to work in the city. And one of the things that I think is a huge problem is a lot of the officers have no connection to the city. And when you don't have a connection to the city, you don't know the kids, you're not familiar with the neighborhood, you don't, you don't know the kids, the kids don't know you, right? And when they don't know you, um, it's very easy for you to view them as a threat. Um, I, when I was younger, we had a neighborhood. So everyone pretty much knew whose kid belonged to who. And, you know, you could have that conversation with the kid and say, okay, you're, you're acting this way, but it was, it was done out of love. And I think um, maybe, and I know you can't require because of the, the, the lawsuit that allowed people to move out of the city to when they're working it. But if you had some type of incentives for bringing police officers back into the city where these, you know, the kids and even the adults, they're your neighbors, you know, so you're, you're living with them, you're shopping with them, you know, you're, you're entertaining with them. You get to know people like that. And that way you won't even have to worry. I don't think uh, as much about, you know, de-escalating or non-escalating because you know each other and they don't have to feel as concerned because one of the things that I talk to people about is, okay, you know, behave this particular way. And a lot of the young people say, whether we do that or not, just like Ms. Shalina said, whether we do that or not, you know, we're still getting beat up or, you know, whatever, because there is this inherent fear of young, particularly young black boys. You know, it, the fear is inherent for what it dates back centuries and may not have anything in particular to do with, you know, the children themselves. And so we have to be honest and talk about, you know, how race impacts um, your perception on who you're interacting with. And then when you have, you see, you look around the country and you see a lot of other individuals who engage in heinous crimes are able to be arrested without being killed. Um, white males in particular, when you see that as a young child, that's a young black or brown child, that's traumatic. Um, and, and you know, it, it makes you lose faith in the system, so to speak, um, because it's like, okay, the system is just set up against me, period. And it's hard as, you know, a, a member um, of the bar to even try to encourage people to do different things and behave in a way that is acceptable because they really don't feel like there's any use in doing it, particularly young people. And then on top of that, what we have to be very realistic about is this pipeline of prison in terms of the school. We have to get back to basic education um, and making sure that everyone knows that, you know, just because a child misbehaves doesn't mean that they're a bad child and start messing up their record and making sure that that record follows them such that other teachers in the future who comes into contact with them, they already have a perception. And then, you know, this kid is getting suspended and expelled. And what do you think the children are going to do if they're suspended and expelled and don't have anywhere to go, don't have anything, you know, constructive, don't have any type of guidance? They're going to get in trouble. So what have you done? You've, you know, pretty much pushed them out of school and pretty much set them up to get involved in the criminal justice system. And that's wrong. We have to really talk about what's going on in terms of education wise with, you know, our schools and whatnot. So I'm not going to go on and on, but there are so many different factors. And I think part of our problem is we're working in silos as opposed to saying, you know, this look from a global perspective and see how everything works together. You know, health is related to um, school. Schooling is related to, you know, economics. Economics is related to X, Y, and Z, and it goes on and on as opposed to working in separate silos, um, be it because of, you know, ego, whatever. You know, we need to get past all of that and see how all of it intersects with one another. And, you know, it's, it's not a job for just one person or one group of people or one sector. This is something that we all have to play, play an active part in. Thank you so much. And just as we said, so many of these things intersect. It really does. And you spoke about the inherent fear and Sam spoke about that earlier and fear is effective. And I think that's why a whole lot of folks then just remove their hands from it, allow this to balloon out of control 
didn't feel like they should step in because it wasn't, they were part of the dominant culture or the majority culture and it, well, it's not happening to me. And so, you know, I'll just let it, whatever's gonna happen, happen. And now it is everyone, you know, everyone now sees, sees what's going on and says, oh my God, I didn't know it was so bad because folks don't believe black people. You know, I always say, believe black folks, believe us when we tell you, believe black and brown communities when they say what is going on. And when you now see that it's the truth. So we are, I just feel like the whole, you know, society is complicit, has been complicit in this continuing as long as it, as it has. They want the reason that it started, but definitely complicit in it by not engaging sooner and believing black folks when they tell you. So, um, and then criminalizing everything. And, and now I'm so grateful for, um, um, you know, folks recording and seeing more how people are called, people call the police on us for simply going about our lives. You know, they call you about the simplest thing because then they too become a part of that um, uh, culture of criminalizing black folks. Oh, they're over here walking on my street. Oh, they're barbecuing. Do they have a right to barbecue? Just you wonder about the mentality of people who feel like they have to police other people or call in folks. The woman in New York that called when the guy asked her to put her dog on a leash and she lied because why? She knows what's going to happen or what could happen they'll believe me they're not going to believe you so nobody's confused we know what it is and they know too that's why they continue to call because i am going to punish you if you say anything to me that i don't like if you do anything because i am the police state right so absolutely and then um again we're just talking about um uh Ms. Moore, you talked about um it's it's police are the catch all of the social ills. We know it's all of those factors that 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 go into how someone ends up in a certain area or you know the things that happen if they're pushed out of school to prison, uh, the school to prison pipeline, and um and so what do you do? Lock them up, lock them up. The land of the free has the most incarcerated people in the world, and there we go. So um, James, James is next. My topic's slightly um, different uh, from the previous topic, so I wanted to yield my time if anyone else wanted to directly respond to Andrea's uh, message. Thank you, good, James. Great. Uh, so one of the things I've been thinking of and make sure I was looking up some specific statistics is I think the police uh, in the United States failure to protect black women and women in general, but specifically black women. Um, there's a recent article I reviewed that really highlighted the, the shock that I, I, I'm i upset I didn't know, but um, I just wanted to share some of these. I don't wanna go too in depth because it can be a, 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 a trigger, triggering, triggering issue, but some statistics for me is that uh, in the US, 20 people are assaulted every minute by their partners. Uh, homicide is the leading cause of death for young African-American women and domestic violence is the second most common uh, for all African-American women. Uh, some of those statistics were you know, extremely shocking um, and upsetting. Um, and it leads more to a point for me and what statistics I've seen there is it talks about it's it's a man's problem. It's not a non-binary woman's problem to fix. Uh, it's a man's problem in conjunction with police department to be better trained. Uh, they even go on to say that a, uh, I forget which organization did the statistic, but they said, 95% of all convicted homicides are committed by men. Um, so it just speaks to me more of, of a men's problem that, that men do need to fix and, and the violent tendencies. And, and even with the judicial system, I know there was a recent case with uh, a football player. I was released from prison or from that process, uh, let's say 24 hours after the, uh, his, his attack on his girlfriend. Um, it's just, it's nowhere near enough time for for her to be safe, her to get with someone who is safe. That's plenty of time for him. Um, even if there is no, even if there's not health issue, no excuse for legal system failing her. Um, so I just wanted to, to share some of those statistics as well. We appreciate that, James. Thank you so much. 
And um, Esther, are you ready or should Commissioner Hadley go ahead? She was having some trouble with her with her Wi-Fi. So Commissioner Hadley. And just to speak on prison, the prison pipeline, um, Commissioner Leon, that you had spoke about. One thing, when you're filling out a FAFSA form for these young kids that are getting these numbers and, and going to jail, that's taking away their opportunity to get uh, funding to go to college or to go to vocational training programs. So, you know, this one act of possibly not de-escalating, de as you say, or going into the neighborhoods, understanding these children, you're setting them up for a lifetime of failure also. You know, and, and I had spoken to a police officer once before. He said, you know, I didn't know they couldn't um, sign up for FAFSA if they have a felony. No, they can't. You, can, you, you're, you will not get federal funding. So, you know, the problem is it's a part of that whole process of systemic racism. You know, when you look at and when you start to peel that onion down and how eat one event can just destroy the rest of their lives, because even though they don't go to prison, but they have that number on them and that felony. And if they can't get that expunged, then guess what? Where are they going to go? But to eight dollars an hour jobs, you know, you I mean, it's, it's a whole process. And here in Cleveland, the living wage is twenty six dollars an hour for a family of four or three, I mean. So if you're not making that amount of money, you are, you're never going to get out. It's just, it's that, that, that mouse on the wheel. You're, you're, it's a continuous cycle. So, you know, I, and I've seen that so many times with, with young adults that come through job corps, it's like, Miss Hallie, this is my last resort. You know, where else am I going to go? So, it's it's really hurtful the way our communities are right now in a state of emergency at all times. So that that was my little rat. <laughs> oh, sorry, Delina. Thank you guys so much. I just want to do a time check. We're at six twenty, which means that we made the right decision tonight, Commissioner Hadley, because we needed to have this conversation. Obviously. So we have 10 more minutes. I want to thank everybody for being so considerate of each other. This feels good. Now this feel like family. I'm telling you, y'all make I'm getting spoiled with this group here. I'm telling you. Um, everyone did exactly what we asked. You kept to the three to five minute time. So everyone got to share. I am, I feel honored that you all stayed and and actually contributed and and opened up um in such a time. So all right. Esther. Yeah, um, my point is going back to like the point that was made about like educating like black kids, like, you know, how to interact with the police. I think the issue with that, um, kids who are born here know that, but immigrants, black kids who are moved here don't know that. I came here, like my family came here as refugees and immigrants, and we don't know that the police, like, you know, will socialize, like, you know, profile you based on your skin tone with other police is here um, to serve and protect us. So like the issue with that is that I am seeing this in my community. So many young, especially the young refugees in black male are getting in trouble with the police because of profiling and they don't know half of their basic rights. And they're just like being like, why did the police pull you? Because you're, you're, you're being racial profiled and you're starting to educate like the immigrants and the refugee community about all these issues. Like, you know, you're black, like, you know, what it means to be black in america so the issue with like it saying oh we have to educate like our young black folks but like not everyone is getting that education and not everybody knows that it's like police officers need to know that because like you know i'm seeing so many of my fellow black immigrant black brothers who are going to jail like you know who don't even know their rights like you know the prison system like it's mostly black males right now like you know the mass incarceration system is mostly black males and a lot of like immigrants are being like you know victims of it because they never got that conversation like you know my mom never gave my brother that conversation it's like you had to really learn for your um your experience like you know both of my brothers have got like racially profiled by police officer pulled over and you know um and i've had to tell my brother his rights because i took a, i took the time to learn like you know these are your rights with the police these are your rights with it but not everyone has like that opportunity so i feel like they re they need to be a part where we're um educating the black and brown immigrants about the issue with policing in America, because so many of them don't know about it and they're becoming victims. 
Thank you so much for elevating that. I am going to pass that information along. Um, our recruitment, uh, the public safety recruitment team does a lot with um, with um, oh, what is it, Cleveland? But it, but we we work, you know, with the uh, naturalization. We would go in and participate in the naturalization. So I want to elevate that for them so that we can come up with something around that. Yes, right. Oh, excellent. Thanks. Um, so I, I work at uh, Case Western Reserve University and uh, we have a, a sort of hybrid um, public safety department that has a lot of security officers and we offer an opportunity for officers to come in, work as security guards or dispatchers and go to the police academy part time and we'll pay for half of that academy for for the people that go through. It doesn't guarantee them a job as a as a police officer here but it will get them the credential so that they can go to any agency uh, within Ohio because the Ohio, uh, as we know, historically Ohio, um, you know, public safety uh, uh, training is, is, is stiff, tough to get through and it's expensive and a lot of people don't have that, that startup cash. So uh, we decided to do that and it's um, fairly new, but uh, we're really, it, you need programs like this to change the demographic of your workforce and to to try to match uh, uh, your your constituents. So, um, and we're really working on attracting, trying to attract more multilingual people as well. So, if you know anybody that's interested, please refer them to me. Oh, you only have to tell us once, right, Shelby? Commissioner. <laughs> Very that's good. Right. Thank that's you. I wanted to bring it up to this group. It looks like there's a lot of power here and power in the right places. So I appreciate any help I can get. Thank you so much. Ms. Moore. Yeah, I, I realized that we're getting close to 630. So I just kind of took my hand down, but I, I just want to share. There are so many other collateral um, consequences as a result of criminal charges that people don't even factor in, especially when we're dealing with these young, um, the, the young children or minors, um, you know, having a criminal background can prevent them from, if they're subsequently involved in as a victim of a crime, it impacts their ability to receive compensation as victim of crimes. And we don't even think about that. And how unfair is that, you know, for one instance or a bad decision or whatever to be penalized in that way? it impacts your ability to rent houses. So after you reach a certain age, where are you supposed to go if you're unable to stay with your parents? Um, they can't go into the military for certain crimes. And the way that the legislator has drafted some of these, some things are simply not eligible to even be sealed or even be you know, expunged. And so again, we're setting our kids up for, for failure before they even have an opportunity to even start good. So these are some of the things I think, you know, I think it's important, again, with me being a political field, it's really important that we stay on top of our legislators and start locally and work our way up to the state and then federal. A lot of times we focus on the federal, but we need to come back to the basics because I, as far as I'm concerned, all politics are local. So that's where I think, you know, it would be uh, helpful because we can put it all on the police if we want to, but it, it doesn't make a difference if we don't follow or stay on top of who our executives are that are appointing, you know, the the directors of public safety and the police chief and, you know, things of that nature. So I think it's, it's inherent and, you know, it's inherent on us to make sure that we're staying on top of who our elected officials are, because, you know, the way these laws are being drafted, you know, it's really, it's taking a toll and, and setting our kids up for failure. Thank you so much. Um, we pride ourselves on being respectful of everybody's time. This meeting is from 5 to 630 and we said we want to stand by that so that folks don't say I can't go to that meeting. They last all night late. They go on and on. No, we want people to come back. So <laughs> um, thank you again, everybody. It, um, I think this this was needed and um, Commissioner uh, Harris. Wow, I thank you all so much. What a good meeting. This is what this meeting is all about, to give us a voice so we can sit down and just um, hear each other. You know, when we were saying, um, you know, before someone raised the point, where do we go? 
this is a place for us to go. You know, CPOP, that's what this is about with the community, to bring us all together, to hear, so each, each, every last one of us can be heard. And then we can come back and, you know, we, Shelly and uh, Commissioner Leon and I can do our research and come up with recommendations and solutions or answers. So I thank you tonight. Um, it is 627. As Commissioner Leon said, we are very mindful of our time. We want you guys to go ahead and eat your dinner. You know, I was sneaking there a minute ago. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> but um, we just, as, as again, next month, what we're going to do, we're going to continue on our path and our agenda because we have a really robust agenda um, to continue and finish up with the CPOP policy plan. We will be on section five which is the review committee. So we're going to really dive into that next month, but first we're also gonna take questions or concerns uh, that you may have that have happened within the next last, the month uh, the month ahead. Um, if you have anything that you wanna say, we're always gonna to have to try to have this open dialogue um, to be heard because that's what this is about. And once COVID is over and we can meet face to face and go from different neighborhoods, that's our, our our biggest mission that we want to do is really bring these meetings out into the community to get the, the voice of people who aren't able to get online or, you know, uh, don't have the access for Internet and so forth. So I yield your time back. I'm giving you two minutes. Thank you so much for attending tonight and we will see you next month. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. It's so good to see you, Jen. Good night. Thanks, Larry. Good night, everyone. Thanks, Lauren.